Welcome everyone, this is Danny and Carl with Get Wisdom and today we're going to continue with the channeling series and today's uh, channeling subject is James J. Angleton who was a prominent figure in the CIA uh, during the Kennedy years. We're kind of revisiting uh, that topic once again and uh, James J. Angleton is uh, a pretty amazing guy. He was with the CIA up until the mid-70s. He started uh, with the OSS in World War II and he was among that group of people, some of whom we've already channeled. Um, Dulles, um, um, Dulles comes to mind. Dulles is probably one of the more important ones that we did. And we also, uh, it was, uh, um, there was the other fellow who was, oh gosh, I can't think of his name now. Um, um, he committed suicide in 1965 with a shotgun. And he was, uh, he was very much involved in, in the Hungary uprising. And trying to get the U.S. to inter intervene on that one. Um, anyway, it'll come to me. But we, but we've yeah. done some some uh, other subjects similar to Angleton. But 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 James um, James Jesus Angleton kind of occupies uh, a very uh, important place in all of this. Uh, for one reason, he wasn't really that well known, but he was he was quite a player, um, second only to perhaps to Dulles when it comes to the CIA. So. Um, we have seven questions for him today, and um, and so Carl, maybe you could kind of uh, give your outlook on on this whole Kennedy thing. And you know, we come back to this a lot. And this was actually a suggestion you had for the channeling series. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit before we get started. Yeah, it's not just that I'm a seasoned citizen now and lived through that time and saw it unfold on my own TV screen and in the newspapers daily and followed it for years and couldn't let it go, which is true for many who experienced living with that news event, which shocked the entire world. Right. People such as myself, I know now in hindsight, I didn't, I didn't know at the time. But people realize there's something really, really fishy about this. And, of course, the prosaic explanation is, well, this was just such a shock that someone in that position could be so vulnerable. And, you know, there was all of these trappings. He was liked by many, not all. He was a controversial president, as almost all are. There were a lot of people who hated him. But he had this charisma and so telegenic and his family as well, very accomplished and had the beautiful wife and children. And uh, it, this this was a national tragedy par excellence. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better news event or screenplay if you're wanting to feed the uh, the television beast. But the meaning goes far beyond that. We realize now. This is an iconic event that involves so many aspects of the struggle between darkness and the light. It was a culmination of a lot of tensions, the pushback the divine realm can bring to bear in answering prayers to help the world become elevated and have things move more towards a normal state of affairs versus all of the control that the darkness has over the, the powerful, the people with the reins of power, the, the governments, the military organizations, the intelligence agencies, and the dark designs they have on the world as a whole to subjugate humanity and keep us not only under control, but punished relentlessly in many, many, many ways. And it's done for diabolical reasons. It's kind of a sport for these beings. They're dark beings themselves. So I don't want to go off in a big lecture. But, but the reason we're going back to this topic is that it's rich with meaning and with many twists and turns that illustrate how these things are done, how they're orchestrated, and how they're covered up. Right. And the various tools. And the more you see examples of how someone who is perhaps an eyewitness and a living witness to something tragic can come forward and give a straightforward account and maybe more than one 
in fact, maybe a chorus of such individuals, but their testimony conflicts with the official story, they will get ignored and discounted. And the press won't bat an eye. They won't see this as something that's now controversial. Why is the official story differing from the eyewitnesses, you see? Yeah. And so all these little inconsistencies, contradictions, seemingly loaded guns or smoking guns is the term that really point to something more complex, more uh, sinister. The fact it isn't pursued, it, it never really gets resolved, and the people really in power don't pay much attention to it, is very telling. So you've had this legion of stalwart JFK assassination researchers who devoted their lives to doing detective work, interviewing people, you know, the shoe leather things. Right. Pouring through archives, pulling out documents. And that's that's a labor of love. And I think it's a divinely inspired labor of love because this is the kind of thing, if people really would see it in its entirety and be able to accept the validity of a lot of the evidence, which is pretty incontrovertible, yeah, it would change their thinking about the meaning of life and the way the world is run in, in, uh, in our times. It's like the 9-11 uh, event, where there are so many things, lots of physical evidence that completely contradicts the official story. Yeah, I, and, I, and I, I tend to put those, uh, the Kennedy assassination, 9-11, um, you know, the two great world wars, you know, what happened in Russia with the genocide there. They're kind of like, um, you know, they're world-changing events where there's a lot of background information. It's not, um, there's a lot of interest in it, but there's a lot of disinformation around it and a lot of, a lot of uh, false paths, so to speak, you know, dead ends. And, um, and, and you know, we finally, with, through the channeling s series, not only getting to the things you're talking about, the, but the whys behind them, which seems to be the almost the most fantastic and unbelievable part of the story in, in many ways. But, I, you know, just, just while you were speaking there, I was checking. The guy, the guy who I was trying to think of there was uh, Frank Weissner, or Wissner, depending on how you like to pronounce his name. But he... He was, you know, he was one of the contemporaries of, of, of James Angleton. So we have Frank Weissner. And then I just want to rattle off some names of some other channeling subjects where uh, perhaps you could say that the Kennedy assassination was kind of the central issue for, you know, uh, or at least one of the questions were asked about the assassination in each one of these channelings. And I think I've left a few people out of this list, but we have L. Fletcher Prouder, Prouty. We have Frank Weissner, which I've already mentioned. We've had Admiral Good Pastor, um, I think it's Good Admiral, but it's Good Pastor. Um, Alan Dulles, as I mentioned, uh, Jim Mars, who wrote a book about the assassination, I think it was called Crossfire. They also made a short movie about it. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower himself, James Forrestal, Lee, Lee Harvey Oswald, Kennedy himself, uh, Edward Lansdale, and Marilyn Monroe. And I think we've got probably a couple others in there that I've actually overlooked uh, when it comes to the assassination. So we've done a lot. Uh, we've done a lot on this on this topic. And one of the things that we found out that I wanted to bring up is that uh, we were able to uh, validate, I think, in two channelings, one with Creator, that there was actually uh, a Lee Harvey Oswald double. We didn't get a lot of details about it, but we did get. Uh, validation verification that there's actually two Lee Harvey Oswalds and the uh the duplicate was an alien imposter uh, a reptilian we're told but not in the conventional uh sense that we've been told about in the past where it was what we call a reptilian replacement where the human was killed and then replaced by a reptilian we had the real Harvey Oswald who was uh, you know this the subject of mind manipulation and a lot of handling. We had human handlers. He worked for the FBI, the CIA, um, and uh, and probably there's some other entities there that uh, that we don't know about that he was actually employed by or used by. And then this reptilian imposter.
so this should be interesting. Like, like I say, I have, I have eight, uh, seven questions for him. And, um, and we, we kind of spread out far and wide of the questions because he, uh, Angleton was there so long involved in so many things, uh, not just domestic, obviously, you know, but overseas. Uh, so he was involved in, um, you know, the establishment of the uh, German intelligence network under Galen and incorporating that with the Alan Dulles's help so that they had a, an existing intelligence service that was basically absorbed into uh, what then became the CIA with Galen's help. And Galen was uh, working for Hitler. So he basically just transferred over to the U.S. services that became part of the intelligence service. Fight, fighting uh, the, the Soviet communism in Europe. So um, it's quite an octopus. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, that brings to mind the incestuousness of the intelligence agencies themselves. And I remember reading a book written by a very insider-level person in the intelligence community, kind of a memoir, I don't recall who this was off the top of my head, but the thing that w that I remember to this day that shocked me at the time was he made a very explicit series of observations and with descriptions that reinforced this phenomenon as being real that the intelligence operatives of the CIA and the KGB had so much in common because they were involved in this clandestine world and caught up in it and feeling powerful and important and so on. It's almost like they shared a certain camaraderie that made them more loyal to one another than to their own parent organizations. And I thought, well, wait a minute. That just doesn't smell right. You know, this is too, too unbelievable because, you know, the enemy is the enemy. You know, if you're, if you're a spy or a counter spy, your job is to infiltrate and be their buddy and get them to accept you as one of them and all of that. But I don't think people will give up their primary loyalty all that easily. Um, especially with everything that goes into the training and wanting to do that kind of work to begin with. But it's you interesting, go into, though, Carl, that, that almost seems plausible, though, given what we know about the alien interference and the fact that they're the overlords yes. of the whole thing. Yes, yes. So I think what's really behind that kind of buddy system that they came to uh, establish, even kind of independently, where they were trading information with one another, and this has come to light again and again and again. and But not because they're supposed to, you see, but it fits with what you're saying, that these operatives may well have been fully controlled by the extraterrestrial alliance. Right. So they're working for the alliance, not for their parent exactly. employers, and they're in a position to really shift Right. You know, current events. And they can throw a wrench in the works. They can do some sabotage or something and and uh, keep the game so going. Right. And keep mean, the game going. Right. Because it's all about the suppression of human suppression right. of the divine within the human, even though the ETs don't really recognize it as such. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the you know, with a poster boy for that might be Kim Philby, who was very close to Angleton and actually betrayed Angleton. And a lot of people claim that that kind of set the stage for everything that Angleton did uh, up through the late 60s and early 70s in terms of kind of sabotaging his own tenure at CIA looking for this mole and being very devoted to Philby even after he um, kind of let everyone know who he was. Kim Philby defected from the British to the Soviets and this had a... Um, um, according to some accounts, it had a, a you know a devastating effect on Angleton. Um, so so you know hopefully my uh, meager seven questions will do this uh, this fellow's legacy justice. Uh, 
And of course, you know, the more important thing is, you know, his observations now that he's a light being. Absolutely. Because he is not his old self anymore. He is his fully enlightened light being divine self. And so that makes a lot of difference. And, um, you know, our, our attention with this series, just to pay my respects to him and all the others who have stepped forward and been willing to talk with us and share important information, we, we value him and we value all of them because they're witnesses to truth whether they were doing good deeds or not so good deeds, depending on the, what they were a part of and led into. And we all are, are corrupted in a way because we're living in a corrupt world. You know, there's a lot of um, dark influences that have shaped all of our institutions. We can't see it because we're immersed in it. It's what we know. It's what we're used to. And but from top to bottom, everything is rotten. It really is. I mean, it, it's amazing, you know. Yeah. And I could, you know, I could go on for hours about it. I just read a thing yesterday. I was shocked. I still can't get over it. There was a fellow in a in a kind of a newsletter thing, and he was predicting that the schools are going to be abolished. They're going to disappear because they're failing. They're really not educating. And they are doing all the wrong things to foster learning and growth. And, and I, you know, hallelujah, <laughs> I, I personally share that, that uh, perspective of the education system. But this is how radically things need to change from where we are right now. So, yeah. Yeah. so I, I, our intent is – the point I'm trying to get to is our intent is never to skewer anyone, to – really pin blame on people. It's really a desire for truth to better understand what happened and why. Right. And, and, and what we can learn about it for what, how we might want to move forward given today's circumstances. Right. And, and visualizing people like him that might be in the public eye um, who, who are kind of have the same, a similar role, you know, maybe we can, we can right. look at them as, you know, we have this tendency as humans to go, well, you know, here's the perpetrator, here's the victim, you know, here's the here's the good guys, here are the bad guys. Well, you know, it's it's time, what we've learned through the series, it's time to stop viewing the world that way. You know, all the right. perpetrators started off as victims. Everyone, including the ETs, are managing all of this needs the healing. So that's the that's the end game here. That's what we're you know, that's that's the the focus that we'd like to to leave with people as they, you know, view the series and come away and think about for themselves, okay, now what do I do? Well, that's what we do. It's love and forgiveness and healing. And yep. the healing, of course, is a big part of the Get Wisdom mission when the Lightworker Healing Protocol, which we've talked about a lot in the series. And even the channeling subjects have talked about that a lot and given, you know, given us a pat on the back about, you know, our uh, your development of that healing protocol and um, and us trying, you know, making an attempt to teaching it to other people and making it available on a worldwide basis. So I um, so I think this is going to be a long one. I think it's going to be interesting, and maybe we should go ahead and get started. Okay, very good. And I'm um, looking forward to learning what we can today. And so I will do my thing as a channeler to go into the state of consciousness that I use to make a connection. And I will go through the creator of all it is, through the Almighty. That's how I do my work. And I do it for safety reasons, for authenticity and certainty that I will connect to the desired target and that target alone. And this is very important because most channelers are being deceived. They are not reaching who they think. And I've heard this for years. I heard it first from archangels I was channeling, and then I heard it again from Creator. More than 90% are corrupted. They're getting hand-holding. They're getting messages of sweetness and light and general encouragement that all is well. They were going to ascend. There's a plan. The shift in consciousness is going to take care of everything. And it's basically a disempowerment. Because they're not doing anything about human problems. They're really not. They're just talking about love and how to be nice and how to raise yourself up. And 
and would that all could do that. And it takes a little bit more. There is a healing process most people need. And they don't talk about that. They don't bring information of that kind forward. And they don't talk about the darkness and what it's up to. Right. It's a huge, huge hole. And people are blinded by all the sweetness, sweetness and light to be complacent. And that's what the end game is. That's the desire. Just to disempower everyone by just giving them tons of reassurance. And then people just kind of go back to their normal lives and they don't do anything. And everyone here is here specifically knowing humanity is in peril. We're under threat. They're here to save the world. If you're not saving the world, you're not awake. You're not doing your job. Right. <laughs> you came here to do that. You know, and also to help heal yourself. So if you're not working on your own healing, you're losing out on right. Goal number two. <laughs> right. So that's my little spiel. And uh, so I'll go ahead and make the connection and we'll uh, see what transpires. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. I, I do that every time because there might be only once someone comes to the series to take a look and they might be really keen on channelers and kind of, kind of wanting to sample what we're doing in comparison right. to others. And it's rather a shock. But I encourage people to think about why that difference is really there. Because we talk about love, too. The God I talk to is all about love. Right. And the healing work that we do is very illustrative of that. I don't see many channelers out there talking about healing, true healing. Right. You know, they talk about how to uplift and how to raise your, vibra uh, raise your vibration and manifest the world you want to see. Yeah. And if you're focusing on negativity and all that kind of stuff, then you're just going to promote it, which is a very compelling message for what I call the armchair ascensionist. And I don't mean to be derogatory, but we need to call it like we see it. And it's an important issue because there is evil in the world. And if, and if the channelers that are out there, saying what they're saying uh, really had an influence on the state of the world, then you would see changes. Well, we're, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And yeah. it has continued to get worse over the 30 or 40 years where these types of messages have been be becoming increasingly more popular. So yeah. the proof's in the pudding. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're, they're not talking about God. They're not including God. You know, it's all a nebulous kind right. of force you know, they talk about the universe and the light and enlightenment and, and, you know, spiritual related terminology. But they don't embrace the divine and they don't partner with the divine. They are separate. And they have closed themselves off in their own little world, their own little bubble. And they're not inviting God in. And it's, that's their mistake. And, and it will cost everyone who follows those folks. Yeah. So, all right. So that's why we're here, even though it's unpleasant. We fully understand that. <laughs> Believe me. I do not love immersing myself in gore. I really don't. I don't watch those kind of movies even. It's disturbing. I don't like it. But when I work with people who are really suffering and have gone through hellish experiences, you know, it has to be faced. But there is a process. There's a way to work through it. Okay. So truth is truth is power. And that's our goal, to bring some more truth forward. So I'll start. Okay. This is James Angleton speaking. Thank you for joining us. Were you able to transition successfully? And were you a victim of what is known as reptilian replacement? I was victimized by the darkness on my transition from the physical body and my passing. Like many individuals, far too many, I was unprepared because I was not spiritual in my focus. And this was my undoing. I was not equipped 
and able to cooperate with the greeters who came to escort me back home to the light. And so I languished. This has been the most trying experience of my existence. There is nothing worse than unremitting evil, desiring to suppress, to torment, to denigrate, and to ramp up hysteria and a kind of extreme state of torture to make every moment painful and squeeze the last drop of fear and terror that can be created in a conscious being. No one could imagine such an existence Yet this is the plight of earthbound spirits who are defenseless and subject to an unfettered attack by the darkness. Those dark demonic beings always out and about will descend on you when you leave your physical body. All that's needed to prevent such an occurrence is to have a belief in the divine and an outlook expecting divine support and just expecting upliftment rather than to return to dust, to disappear, to be ended. That is a bleak future indeed. And no matter how you describe it or put a face on it, no one wants to go there in the final analysis. Even if you are suffering and in pain, most will choose that over death, except at its greatest extremes. That is the great fear that has crept in with lack of belief in the world. It is a travesty. It is an abrogation of responsibility of each and every human being to be in divine alignment and share the joy and the knowledge of that with all they meet. You need to come together. You need to work together to overcome the struggle and the strife. My difficulties all became very much a point of focus when I myself was taken out by the extraterrestrial alliance. And I was replaced by a reptilian being this was because of my prominence in the intelligence agency. And this is a central action arm of the extraterrestrial alliance. The group of dark extraterrestrial beings working in concert with the goal of subjugating and now eliminating humanity. During the period of my physical life, the goal was not immediate annihilation. That had been planned, but was thwarted. When such things happen, Almost always as a consequence of divine intervention, there is a period of retooling, of rethinking, reworking of plans. The 
extraterrestrials plan many decades in advance to carry out their aims. Many things they do are quite sophisticated and quite intricate in the orchestration. It might depend on introducing a new technology into human culture and then letting that spread and become adopted and become a springboard for mischief because it can be used for corrupt purposes even as humans embrace the delights of what it offers in a material sense. This is true of all your communication capabilities and the internet. All the while, they are planning ways to hamper you, even as you feel you are advancing and gaining power. So there is a gap in my participation here during essentially the entire scope of the questions you will be asking me. Nonetheless, I can answer the questions because I am privy to all that happened and the information involved with the plans that were in force how they were executed, the thinking of the imposter who assumed my identity, and the various events that took place in the back and forth of the occurrences themselves, sometimes misidentifying how humans might react and being surprised, and many times not appreciating the workings of the divine, always having an influence to some degree, depending on the amount of human outreach through prayer, to be a counterforce to the darkness and serve to redirect where possible and soften the harshest of the plans and the outcomes that result. The extraterrestrials have seen this flow and flux through the ages and do not fully understand this. They attributed it to some hidden human power beyond their understanding. And this serves as kind of a source of intrigue. So this is one card the divine plays again and again to keep them from annihilating you outright in disgust, but stringing them along to let their anger abate and give them an opportunity to indulge their curiosity to see what might happen next as a kind of challenge for them to overcome. This is an exercise in biding time at best. Time will run out very likely at some point without further human pursuit of divine intervention in a concerted fashion to deal directly with the darkness and its aims. People need to understand that a general prayer for safety or simply well-being is underpowered in specificity. You must ask for what you truly need to have happen to have the greatest degree of divine response. That is what is needed for high level problems. And we can tell you there is no higher level problem at the moment 
than the extraterrestrial alliance in your midst running your world from behind the scenes. Okay, thank you. Would it be accurate to say that you were intimately involved and orchestrated the cover-up of the assassination of John F. Kennedy? Can you tell us about the defection of Kim Philby and what you did to protect the CIA during the 1950s, 60s, and into the early 70s? 